Today's the last of our spiritual leadership series, and of course, it's also Father's Day, so we're looking at the masculine and the, the leadership of, of fathers and men and the masculine within all of us. And um, I just recently read a book called Becoming Nicole, The Transformation of an American Family, and it opens with um, the description of a video. Wayne Maines is videotaping his son, Wyatt, who is dancing in front of the reflection in the stove, and he's about two. And uh, Wyatt is wearing nothing but a tutu and some Mardi Gras beads. <laughs> and he's just moving and grooving and, you know, and then Wayne starts interacting with him and says, turn around, wave to dad. And so, and these are adopted twin boys that um, he, Wayne and his wife Kelly had adopted. And um, so Wyatt is, is um, in his element, you know, just really enjoying the movement and his look. He likes the reflection he's seeing. And then Wayne, his father, says, now, now, Wyatt, flex your muscles. Show me your muscles. And you see how his little face drops from the joy to confusion. And his dad persists, you know, flex your muscle like this, do this, you know. And the boy is, 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 is now kind of divided between the joy of the dance and the pleasing of the father. And so eventually he kind of does a little, and that's about as much as dad's going to get, and the disappointed dad turns the video camera off. Yeah. And so the ways in which we have defined what does it mean to be masculine in our world have had tragic consequences. That a man or a boy is taught that he is strong in body, but weak in his emotions. That he is strong in his religiosity, but weak in his spirituality. That in order to be a real man, he has to be strong in his power over others and weak in his ability to share power and, be, and share equality with others. That the manlier that a man is, he is stronger in his dominance of nature and weak in his ability to be nature. And he is strong in his ability to hurt and to kill and to harm, but weak in his ability to nurture and to preserve life. This is what we've taught our men and boys conventionally. And it's hurt all of us. And we got a world that's really hurting. And I believe maybe this is the place in which we can look for our answers. Because you know what they say, what is in the way becomes the way. And as spiritual beings, we have to look at what is in the way in order to walk the way of truth and wholeness and possibility and healing and oneness that we know in our hearts to be true. We've upheld these false ideas of masculinity, not just at the expense of boys and men, but of girls and women and all the gender expressions on the planet. We've done it at the expense of our own planet. We've done it at the expense of our mother earth, of our home. And it's because we've defined masculinity as something that is inherently rejecting the feminine. So everything is described in a way in which it pushes away what is feminine, when in exactly what we need is more the, the, the sculptural depiction that I've seen before of St. Francis holding his arms around St. Clair, who he saw as his equal. St. Clair, who was ahead of, of, of her own, um, the poor Clares, her own um, nunnery, I guess you could say, convent, and, and St. Saint, and Saint Francis, of course, the founder of the Franciscan order. And, and the, but he saw St. Clair as his equal, as his friend. And he held that space like a shelter of the sacred masculine around the divine feminine. That's exactly the image. That's exactly the image that I see when I see a new world being born. 
that within ourselves, that our sacred masculine can be that the strong arms, the strong foundation, the place in which we can hold the, the midwifing, the birth of the divine feminine back into the world, and that these two can be one once again, united in the oneness. And, and, it, and really all that ails us can be healed and harmony can be restored. You know, uh, we teach that our men are strong and what we usually think of is physical strength, right? But what about spiritual strength? What about emotional strength? This is the path of the sacred masculine. I'll never forget when I was in my 20s, it's seared in my heart, this experience, and maybe I've told you before and I'll probably tell you again because it was so formative for me. I was sitting with my dad, my Aunt Pat had uh, melanoma. She was actually, when she was originally diagnosed with a, this form of cancer, skin cancer, she was given six months to live, but she defied the odds and lived 15 years. She was at that time the longest survivor of melanoma in the United States. And she and my uncle lived in Indiana, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where my parents were from. And so they would travel to Chicago once a month. And so we really, my sisters and I really got to know my aunt even better. Everybody loved Aunt Pat. She was one of those people, you know, just redhead, freckles. And, and you know, when she was growing up, she laid with her friends and, with baby oil smothered all over her body on foil. <laughs> so you can see where, you know, she might have developed a problem with her skin. But she was one of these people that just, you know, the things we didn't know, right? And, the, and that's kind of what I'm talking about today, the things we haven't known, the things that we've known, but we sort of didn't realize how important they were. But Pat would walk in a room and she'd just light it up, you know, one of those kinds of personalities. And she was my dad's favorite sister. And, and so we were sitting one night, um, we had just gotten the news, I think the day before, that my aunt had made her transition. And it was just my dad and I, we were the only ones up. There was a fire going in the living room. And he started to cry, but it really wasn't a cry. It was like a contorted uh, sort of, you know, his body kind of heaving and his face kind of contorted a sort of sound <laughs> that couldn't quite come out, you know? <laughs> and what he was able to say through his crying was, I'm such a coward. He was so embarrassed that he was crying grieving his favorite sister, so embarrassed that his daughter would witness such a thing. And it broke my heart. And I said, Dad, you'd be a coward not to cry. It takes bravery to express your emotions. And it was just that, you know, hugging him, saying that, and kind of sitting in that space together. But it, it it's in me, you know, it's in, I carry that in, in me. As, a, as a, break, a broken place, but a broken open place that I hold for the men and the boys of our world. That it may be healed. And for all of us in the world, that it may be healed, that we may be healed, that we may put ourselves back together again. You know, Grace um, left this week too, our goddaughter, and her mother moved, and she was, we were drawing pictures back and forth as sort of a process of the move. And she drew this picture of Brenly and I crying. And then she ripped it in two and put it back together and said that we'll always come back together or something like that. I know, right? <laughs> the brilliance of children, you know? And that's, that's the path. That's the path right there. It's like allowing, allowing the space to be who we are and knowing that even when it feels broken, it's a broken, open kind of thing. And when we come back together, somehow we're, even through the tape and the glue, we're like stronger, right? Because it's, it's the, the brilliance of seeing what needs to be healed. That, that fires us up, that gives us passion, and that gives us compassion. The two, again, sort of that masculine, feminine dancing together, the compassion and the passion, the action and the, the receptivity and the beingness, 
all of these traits that are part of one whole. So when a man is freed or when a person is freed from this prison of false teachings of what is masculine, and you know we all have masculine and feminine energies within us that we're always working with, but if we have this really um, sort of crippled idea of what, what masculine is and this constant pushing away and pushing down and, and, and ignoring of what feminine is, what does it leave us? You know, because there is divinity in that femininity, there is sacredness in that masculinity, and it's meant to come together within us. So this holistic expression, when we reject the, the feminine, we reject Mother Earth herself, we reject receptivity, we reject spiritual surrender, we re reject so many aspects of the spiritual path that are absolutely key. This compassion, this kind of love, this kind of nurturance, this kind of openness. And so it's that, in a way, that we reclaim by also reclaiming what is true in the masculinity, what is true that we are looking for in the real strength, the spiritual and emotional strength that we are seeking. It's potent and it's healing. You know, Jesus said just as often, or maybe more often, that he was the son of man as he did, the, that he said he was the son of God. And, and, and so he emulated for us what it looks like to be a divine human being, but he also emulated for us what it looks like to be a man who is whole in his divinity as a masculine and feminine being. He even referred to himself as a mother many times. He talked about himself as the mother hen who under his wings would gather up all of Jerusalem in his compassion. He wasn't afraid of that in a machismo culture over 2,000 years ago. He wasn't afraid to say that. And he wasn't afraid. And I mean, I'm sure he was afraid, but he pushed through it. And he was strong and he was a fierce activist for all beings, you know? He was about inclusivity. He was somebody who, who in, invited into his circle the, the outcasts, the social outcasts of the day. He invited the Samaritans and the tax collectors and, and the prostitutes to hang out with him, right? And in today's world, that would be inviting all the transgender people to be with us and all the people of color to be with us and all the beautiful variations of humanity to sit together with us in equality in the circle. He had women who were disciples right beside him and teaching alongside him. He had women who were financially supporting and following him. He didn't seem to see the inequalities. He saw what the world did, but he saw through it as he said, I am in the world, but not of it. And so he offered us this, this appearance of what it looks like to be the sacred masculine who is not at all rejecting in any way the divine feminine within him, but expressing both in beautiful balance. And we have many examples of that. You know, when Jesus, um, when his good friend Lazarus was dying, and he knew that he was going to resurrect Lazarus from the dead, but he still, in the shortest sentence of the Bible, it says, Jesus wept. And he wept because he loved his friend, and he wept because of the compassion he felt for all the people around him that were grieving, even though he knew, and in a way, it's a metaphor to me, of the, the raising up, of, of the wholeness of the human divine being, the bringing forth of the sacred masculine, that Lazarus died and he was in that cave and there was Jesus calling him forth, you know? Calling forth the wholeness, calling forth the oneness, calling forth the real man. Matthew Fox talks about what a real man looks like in his book on sacred masculinity called The Hidden Spirituality of Men. He says, they are spiritual warriors, not soldiers. They learn to battle the inner holy jihad, a battle to overcome the ego's ways of dominance and power and greed. They listen as deeply as they teach. They wage peace, not war, and they understand that waging peace happens in the heart first. They hunt for ways to heal and preserve life instead of to take it, to heal and preserve all that is good and beautiful in the world. 
They have inclusive families and they expand the fatherly heart to welcome all people. They experience and express their emotions. They channel their aggressions in ways that do not harm themselves or others. He gives the example of the martial arts. They respect women and partner and serve beside them as equals. And I've kind of add, I've actually changed some of these words myself, so I should say it's adapted from Matthew Fox. And he says, this is his, they refire rather than retire when they become elders. And he describes the refiring as the teaching of the young people as the mentorship of the next generation. You know how much that is needed? You know how many boys need their attention drawn away from violent video games and constant accessibility to porn that is teaching them about sexuality? You know how many boys need a mentor? A lot. With seven billion people, half of them. <laughs> We've got work to do, right? Yeah. So that's one of the great ways that we can offer ourselves to the world, to stand up, to be a voice for regulation in these industries that, that hurt us, but also to be a mentor, to be an example, to be that, that whole man, or that whole woman in our, in our processes of sharing with the next generation and offering what we can about what we've learned about the spiritual path. We need spiritual men like the ones in this room. Amen? <laughs> and more of you. <laughs> to spread the message, to be the message, to emulate that message. And for women not to succumb to the conventional wisdom that is not wisdom at all. And to instead reach for the spiritual, the knowing, and be strong in standing in that truth. Integrity of that truth, that spiritual leadership. That's spiritual citizenship. That's being who we've been called to be. So my father had a massive heart attack when he was 43. And he survived it. His doctor suggested that he um, stop eating beef and change some of his ways. But we all know that real men eat beef, right? That's what the cattle industry has sold us. <laughs> And to the detriment of their hearts and to the detriment of our planet, that continues to be a sort of idea that real, if you're going to be a real man, then you're a man who eats beef. I'm not trying to make a big thing about what, how you should eat. So let's not go off on a tangent here. <laughs> but I'm just talking about how we're taught, you know, how the ads you know, have shaped these ideas of what it means to be masculine and how, and how off base it can be and how harmful they can be. You know, so my dad changed his diet at 43 and he started losing weight and exercising and he was much healthier. But you know, this, this emotional prism that he lived in, this idea of that, you know, to be a courageous man meant he could never show emotion. I think, I think in a way, maybe it killed him, honestly. Because I saw my dad's feminine side. He, he, he raised roses and he, he or had roses in his garden and he took real pride in that. And I, I saw how, you know, he was very, he was affectionate and he was loving and he was kind and he was, you know, a good listener. He paid attention to, well, sometimes a good listener. He paid, <laughs> <laughs> gotta be honest, sometimes he was horrible, but. Uh, <laughs> But he did in the way that like he paid attention to my friends, like he knew their names and where they were going to college. I was so impressed that he remembered that. Like a year or two later, they'd come over and he'd ask them specific questions that showed he took an interest in them. And that made a difference for them and for me. It was a way of sort of being uh, an extended father for others, you know, just in the simple way of, of paying attention and caring and letting them know that he cared. So there were, there were all these ways that I saw, but yet, yet I wonder, sometimes I wonder if that final heart attack was just a, that at 61, when he left us suddenly, was just a, like a, an inability, you know, to be what he thought a man was supposed to be. And, and all that love locked up in there, you know, that wanted to be expressed. Wasn't, it wasn't okay in his mind to be expressed because it's not what a real man did. Ugh. It's hard. In the Mainz's story, 
with Wyatt and Wayne and his, their, um, the mother Kelly and the other twin brother Jonas. There's much more to the story that happens. You know, it turns out that even at the age of two, little Wyatt, who was dancing in the reflection, knew that his body looked like a boy's, but on the inside, he was a girl. And he would talk about it. He called himself a boy girl. And all of his friends saw him as a girl. And even his twin brother, Jonas, never, you know, flinched from the idea that his brother, Wyatt, was a girl. <laughs> and yet... His father and his mother was supportive, but yet his father, Wayne, boy, he had so looked forward to raising these twin boys and teaching them to hunt and fish and do all these manly things. And it was so hard for him to accept anything around femininity in, his, in the expression of his son. And so he buried himself in work. And then after work, he would go and exercise for hours. And he completely distanced himself from the family for many, many years. But there was a time when shift happened in the family, when, when um, Wyatt began to be bullied and, and when the inequality and the injustices of who Wyatt was began to, to really show up. And, and Wayne came around. Anybody can transform, you know? <laughs> And Wayne really transformed into an advocate and an ally and somebody who stood beside his son who became his daughter, Nicole. And when she changed her name and, and really stepped into the truth of who she was, he couldn't help but accept and love and become, come to appreciate the fact that he had this amazing daughter. And he would stand beside her and, and not only advocate for her and for her rights, but he became the face of the parent who had changed, who rejected the, the feminine, essentially, by rejecting his daughter and learned to accept the feminine. You know, so the story wasn't so much. It was about the transformation, of course, of, of a, a girl trapped in a boy's body, freeing herself to become the truth of who she was. But just as much, it was a story of a man who had rejected the divine feminine in every way. And as he accepted his own daughter's transition, accepted that aspect of himself. I don't know if he would say all that, but I can see it in the story where he stood side by side and he told the story of what it was like to be Wyatt's father who, and, and now Nicole's father. And, and what his process was like was influential not just for Nicole's life, but for the whole state of Maine who changed laws in, in, to respect some transgender rights and safety that then spread out to the whole United States. And so it was one man's ability to shift completely the conventional ideas that he had, the limited false lies that he had about what it means to be masculine and to accept more of the feminine that allowed a, a, a huge shift in, in justice and equality and safety and love to have happened. And this is one person's life. But there's so many opportunities for all of us to grab a hold of these truths, to be these truths, to emulate these truths. Ramal, um, Ramald is a saint from the, he became a saint, of course, they become saints much later. <laughs> um, but he was from the 11th century and his story is really moving. I've always been really moved by this artwork made by one of the Kamadalese monks um, at the Hermitage in Big Sur that I like to go to. And it's based on the uh, Camadoli, Italy, um, the monastery there. And this is um, one of the early formative leaders, um, uh, Romold. And Romold um, had a story where he witnessed his father. He was very much a, a boy of the world, a young man of the world. And he witnessed his father murder someone over property. And, and so the two lessons he was getting about masculinity, the idea that, that property is more valuable than human life, and that violence is an okay way to uh, resolve conflict, were completely unacceptable to his soul. It seems like something sort of broke in him that day, and he just said, I, I, no, I can't do this. And he went to the monastery, and he became a monk, and then eventually became, like I said, a, a leader for the Kamadalese monks. But I love this image. It just, it really, for me, it's like it really, it really is a snapshot of the sacred masculine, you know? 
He's strong in his body, but he's open and surrendered to spirit. He's receptive. He's receiving. In the description of the artwork, it says that um, this man becomes a living witness, a quiet example of the depth contained in the natural expression of vulnerability and desire. And he sits with his hands raised in prayer in the moment when tears of joy and compassion flow. And you can see the tears coming down the side. And the light is meant to represent the divine light that he is bathing himself in, you know? So there's this sense of all of it there. There's a sense of the divine masculine, the sacred masculine, as, as a, 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 an emotional component and a spiritual component and a physical component, all of it in one. And so that's what it can look like for all of us. To embody our truth becomes the radiance. And what comes then are the tears of compassion for a humanity that gets it really wrong sometimes, but then can make it right. That alone is worth breaking our hearts open for. Because when we put them back together, they're better than they've ever been before. You know, the cracks are where the light comes through. The cracks are where the divine love flows through more easily. And, it, and, it, and there's a freeing. So there's a freeing sense in that picture to me of, of Romald with his arms up in the air. He's been freed of the limited ideas, the false ideas of who we really are. And he's been freed into the divine description of the wholeness of the human, the fully expressed human being. And that freeing is an opportunity for all of us to be freed. Interestingly enough, Ramald's feast day is June 19th. June 19th is Juneteenth from 1865 when the slaves in Texas were finally told that they were free, even though the nation had freed our slaves before that. It wasn't until that because the owners were able to get another season out of them that they were told they were free. And then the TV show Blackish they uh, depict this scene where there's a boy in the center and, and they're being told that they're free. And so, and he says, what does it mean to be free? And there's like a, a, a pause. All the adults who've been lifelong slaves, they're not really sure. They've never experienced it firsthand, you know? Nobody really knows what to tell the young boy. What's it like to be free? Do we know what to tell our boys and our girls? What's it like to be free? Because have we experienced it firsthand? Until we've experienced it firsthand, we don't fully know, but together we can figure it out. And that's what happens in this scene. There's this moment of confusion and like the adults should know, but they don't know. Nobody knows because everybody's been enslaved. And we've all been enslaved to these ideas of what it is to be masculine and it is, is oppressing us and it's killing us and there's a moment when we all stand and we go what could it be like to be free and you know what happens in blackish they start singing and dancing and there's so much joy and as soon as they start speaking one freedom another one comes and another one comes and the freedoms just spill out of them in joyous expression and that's what I imagine for us when we release ourselves for the enslavement of this idea of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a boy, or what it means to be a human being that has been half a human being, because we want to be the fully realized divinity that we've come to be, and in order to be that, we have to free these old ideas and let them go. We have to let that which has been in the way become the way to the healing of our planet, and we can do it. We can do this. Side by side, hand in hand, heart to heart, soul to soul. We can do this. We need everybody in this room. The time has come, yes?